times it seems like we only worship God when worship is convenient or when everything's going our way. Uh, I would like to reiterate and explain to you again, we don't worship God because of where we are or what's going on in our life. We don't even worship God necessarily for what He's done. You say, why should we worship the Lord? We worship the Lord because of who He is. Amen. Brother, if you ever get to the place where you can get to where... Uh, look, look, I mean, I thank God for all the things He's blessed me with. Clothes on my back, shoes on my feet, food in my belly. You know, I, I thank God. Good family, roof over my head. Glory. Wonderful. I shout on all that. But listen to me. You realize all that can get taken away. Yeah. You realize you could lose your family. You realize your house could burn down. You realize this economy could take a tremendous downturn into this cashless society, and every $100 bill you've got, they'll declare, ain't worth a dime. I mean, it's heading that way, brother. What you going to shout about then? What you going to shout about when you wasn't able to go eat, you know, steak last week? What you going to shout about when they repoed your car? What you going to shout about when persecution really comes? What? Brother, you're going to have to learn to tap into the fact that you're saved and he's still God yeah. this morning. Yeah. And if you can worship like that, you can worship no matter what's going on around you. You worship because of what he's doing in you yeah. and who he is this morning. He never changes. We worship because he is the Lord and he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Alpha, Omega, beginning, ending, first, last. Uh, yeah, yeah. We worship Him because of who He is this morning. And uh, uh, if you ever tap into that, that'll help you, friend. I want you to take your Bibles and go to my favorite book of the Old Testament, 1 Samuel. And we're going to look at chapter number 3 this morning. 1 Samuel and chapter number 3. I was mulling over some of these thoughts, considering preaching it at youth camp to the kids. And the Holy Ghost didn't give me liberty to do so. And I believe he will this morning. 1 Samuel in chapter number 3. Uh, and I'd like to preach to your heart this morning. Um, I'm going to do something maybe slightly different for you note takers that generally uh, keep up with what we're preaching and points that we're preaching. I'm probably going to preach the main body of the message first. And preach the introduction second. You say, preacher, you can't do it. I'm fixing to right now. Praise God. <laughs> so uh, I'm, just, I'm just, I'm preaching more of a message to you than a sermon this morning, okay? I got something on my heart and I want to give it to you. And so uh, you, you, you listen, which is absolutely the key to the message this morning. First Samuel chapter number 3, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And we'll probably read about 10 verses here. 1 Samuel chapter 3, and verse number 1, if you found your place with me, say amen. amen. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. Uh, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, uh, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Uh, can I pause right there and say this? Uh, here's a young man that hasn't been around the Lord enough yet to know when he's speaking. So it takes an older Christian, if you will, to instruct him to let him know this is what the voice of God sounds like. 
You know one reason we take these young kids to camp? Because they're at a place many times either in their life physically being young or spiritually being very young that they have not got the place yet where they understand what the voice of the Lord sounds like. So we as adults try and take them and say, this is what God sounds like and this is what it looks like when God moves so that they understand when God comes speaking, they'll know what to listen for. We pause right there and say, God help us as parents. We have taught our children everything but how to listen for when God speaks this morning. We teach our children how to hit baseballs and softballs. We teach our children how to throw outs in the home plate. We teach our children how to shoot basketballs. We teach our children how to throw touchdowns. We teach our children how to kick soccer balls. We teach our children how to swim laps. We teach our children how to eat and what they should eat. We teach our children how to drive. But it seems like when it comes to spiritual matters, we say, well, I'm just going to let them figure it out for themselves. God knows. God forbid, there are so many voices in this world, mom and daddy. It is your job to teach your children what God's voice sounds like this morning. And here he said that Samuel didn't know the Lord yet. The word wasn't revealed unto him. Verse 8, and the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Can I meddle even a little bit farther before I dive off into the message this morning? Isn't it something that when the child perceived that his father figure called, he didn't just lay in the bed and say, well... Maybe he'll call me twice. Maybe he'll call me three. I'll get up later. No, no, no. When he heard the voice of Eli, he popped right up in the middle of the night and said, Do you need something? Mom and Daddy, teach your children obedience the first time. Not, not, I'm going to count to three. Count to three hogwash. I done told you. Hey, hey, what you going to do, Mom and Daddy, when that child keeps running from you to say, Stop. Stop. No, I said stop. By the time you say the third stop, they done 20 foot farther. What if they getting close to a road and there's a truck coming fixing to cream them and the first stop is highly vital for their safety. Teach your children obedience without question that when you say something, they got enough trust in you that they can listen to what you have to say. Amen. Amen. That's good preaching even if you are doing the brother's horn. <laughs> The Lord called Samuel again the third time. He arose, went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. I very rarely pick my Bible up to read it that I don't utter those very words. Very rarely do I pick my Bible up to read it that I don't bow my head and say, Speak, Lord, a servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. This morning I'm preaching on the thought, the benefits of hearing. The benefits of of hearing. We, we are living in a generation, we are living in a society that Jesus said had come and would come. He said we're living in a generation that their ears are waxed dull of hearing. That they, they have ears but they can't hear. They got eyes and they can't see. You realize one of Jesus' favorite sayings in the New Testament is this. He says it three times in the Gospels and he says it seven times in the book of the Revelation. It's in red letters. Jesus says this saying ten times. He said, He that hath an ear, let him hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Ten times Jesus says this thing. I reckon he's trying to get something across to us. Y'all realize this morning when Jesus says, uh, Brother Medlin, he that hath an ear, let him hear. He's not talking about do you have physical ears? We realize everybody has physical ears. The problem with uh, uh, what Jesus is saying is everybody ain't got spiritual ears this morning. Well, we've got ears to hear everything the world says. 
says. We've got ears to hear everything that our friends say. We've got ears to hear everything that the entertainment industry says. But very few of us have ears to hear what the Spirit saith to our heart this morning. You realize that's the problem with the last days this morning? Paul said this in 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said in the last days they would heat to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they would turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. We're living in a day people don't want to hear the truth no more. We're living in a day people don't like the truth. We're living in a day people don't want to hear the truth about what's going on in politics. People don't want to hear the truth about what's going on uh, in racism. People don't want to hear the truth about God. People don't want to hear the truth about heaven and hell and salvation. People would rather believe a lie. People would let, rather hear uh, what they want to hear and be told what they like to hear than hearing the truth. I was reading the other day, Brother John and Daniel, and over in Daniel it said this. It said that Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, he would cast down truth to the earth. Truth would be falling in the streets. Another in other words, in the last days, Brother Brandon, one of the marks is people don't want truth anymore. They want everything but truth. They want to be coddled to. They want to be catered to. They want to be pampered. They want to be pumped up, primed up, picked up, pepped up. But what they don't want is somebody look them in their God-given eyeball and tell them what thus saith the Lord this morning. Listen, at the end of the day, it is not my opinion that matters. At the end of the day, it is not your opinion that matters. At the end of the day, it is not Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, or ABC's opinion that matters. At the end of the day, it matters have you heard from God. Have you tapped into the truth of heaven and heard the truths of God this morning? Here, there's a lot of voices going around in Samuel's life. There's a lot of voices that are swirling around him, but Samuel taps into the right one this morning. Now, I told you I'm going to throw my outline out to you, then I'm going to preach my introduction to you. So here we go. You say, preacher, how can I hear the voice of God? How do I know uh, when God is speaking to me? Preacher, I want to know when God speaks. And preacher, I want to be able to listen to God speak. How do I hear what God says? How does God speak in 2020? In 2020, how does God speak? Well, that's very simple. It's all in that Bible. Firstly, let me say God speaks through the Scriptures. God speaks through the Scriptures. Now, let me stop here and say this. Do not, do not, do not say God's not speaking to me while your Bible sits closed. Do not say, I want to hear what God wants out of my life when your Bible sits closed day after day, night after night, week after week. If you want to hear the voice of God, open that blessed old book up and listen for His voice. It is His voice on paper. It is His voice on print. It is His voice on page. And if you want to hear the voice of God, you're going to get it by tuning out the external distractions, Finding you a quiet place, opening that blessed book, and letting the voice of God speak to your spiritual ears this morning. Y'all listen to me. Everything that God's got to say is in that book. Now I'm going to tell you there's other ways that God speaks. But everything that God says will line up with that book. Do not come to me and tell me, well preacher, God told me this. And there's clear scripture against that. That's a lie. God ain't spoke to you. You lying. You done got something that ain't true. God will never contradict what he has already said in the 66 books of this blessed old Bible. You say, well, preacher, I just know what I feel. I couldn't care less what you feel. Well, preacher, I just know what I heard. I couldn't care less what you heard. If what you feel and what you heard and what you experienced don't line up with what that book said, you have not heard from God. You have heard from yourself or you have heard from a devil this morning. This morning he's put it down in print for us. It's the well of pure water when I'm thirsty and dry. It's the bread when I'm hungry and worn. When the battle gets to raging, it's my faithful sword. It's a shelter from life's troubled storms. It's the light to my pathway. It's the lamp to my feet. When the world gets so dark I can't see. And I've not made a change in one word that it said. But it sure made a change in me. It's the blessed old book that I hold in my hand. True from beginning. 
to end. It's a solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it. Now it keeps me from sin. Say, I want to hear the voice of God. Open the book this morning. The benefits of hearing, we see he speaks through scriptures. Can I say also, he doesn't just speak through scriptures. He speaks through scriptural sermons. He speaks through sermons. He speaks through preaching. You say you got a verse of scripture on that? I certainly do. Titus chapter 1 verse number 3. The Bible said, in due times, God hath manifested his word through preaching. I like that word manifested, Brother Roger. The word manifested means to reveal something that has been hidden. It means to expose something that you didn't see before. Ain't that what preaching does? You know what preaching does? It opens up things of the Bible that you've never thought about, never seen before. God anoints a man, fills a man, touches a man, births a message in a man's heart, and that man expounds to you the truth of God, and you hear it and you say, huh, that's God speaking to me. That's God dealing with me. You know something that's awesome, man? I found this out. You can pre- I can preach on tithing and God save somebody. I've seen it happen before. You can preach on giving and God save somebody and they'll get saved and I'll think, well, I didn't even preach on that. I didn't even preach on getting saved and somebody got saved, yeah, but I found the Spirit of God can take a sermon from the Word of God and He can speak something into somebody's heart that I didn't even think He was doing. Let me pause right here and say this. If, if you want all these individuals that, well, I, I, I don't need a preacher and I don't need a pastor and I, I, I don't need to go to church. Well, listen to what I'm saying. You labor at a great disadvantage. You are not hearing everything that you could be hearing this morning. Do you realize I didn't write this? I'm just telling you what it is. There are things that God will give through preaching that he will not give directly to you this morning. Say, so where do you get that from? Over there where Jesus fed the 5,000, it said this. When Jesus' brother Gary fed the 5,000, the Bible said Jesus took the bread, blessed it, break it, and Jesus did not hand it directly to the multitude. Jesus gave it to the disciples, who's a picture of the preacher, and he let the disciples hand the bread to the multitude. You know what that is? That's God giving the bread of life to a man and saying, now go feed my sheep with it. Now go feed them with it. And brother, sermons are a way you hear the voice of God this morning. You hear him speak. You hear his voice through sermons, through scripture. You hear his voice through supplication. Do you realize prayer, supplication, prayer is not just you talking to God. It's also God talking to you. If your prayer life is a one-sided dialogue, it's not dialogue this morning. If your prayer life is just you constantly doing all the talking, you leave in very little room for God to talk back. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I was laying in bed yesterday. I, I, I got home from visiting at the hospital and running Abigail to go uh, uh, for her birthday. She just turned 13 on Friday. And uh, man, I, I, was, I was wore out all week at camp uh, and, and, and six and a half hours to drive back home on Friday. And immediately I got home and drove two and a half hours to South Carolina to go pick Cody and Charity up and just uh, just wiped out. And so I got up about three o'clock yesterday afternoon. I just, I just laid down in my bed. And I was laying there and I, I couldn't go to sleep but I was just laying there resting. I was talking to the Lord. And I was telling the Lord about some things that was on my heart. And I was telling the Lord about some uh, burdens and issues and things. And I'll be honest with you, right smack dab in the middle of me complaining to God, Brother Mike, right smack dab in me telling God about this and about that, God stopped me right in the middle. And I'm telling you, just as sure as I'm sitting here, the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart. And he started showing me scripture and started telling me this and that. And you know what I ended up finding out? God didn't jump in my pity party with me. God kicked me in the butt instead of letting me stay in my little shell of a pity party. God yanked me up and said, hey, I've been there too. I know what that's like. Uh, You say, what did it do? It helped me this morning. He speaks through supplication. He speaks through sermons. He speaks through scriptures. Can I say he also speaks through songs? That Bible says, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I don't know about you, but I felt the Spirit of God speaking to me and heard His voice speaking to me while they were singing just a minute ago. Now listen, once again, it's got to be something that lines up with Scripture. I've heard all kinds of songs. That was the most anti-scriptural garbage and goobly gob and hogwash. That ain't God speaking this morning. But a song that lifts Jesus up and a song that's got Bible in it, son, that's something God can speak through. Talking this morning about the benefits of hearing. There's two men that I want to highlight to you this morning. I'm going to hurry and be done. Uh, 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 I told you I'm preaching backwards. Now I'm running the other way. 
Uh, there's two men that I want to talk to you about this morning that I found absolutely understood the benefits of hearing this morning. I'm going to throw these two men out at you. Uh, many of you have probably never heard their names before, but I hope we'll become acquainted with them uh, by the end of the message here in the next few minutes. One, his name was Jack Phillips. Jack Phillips died 108 years ago because he would not hear or listen. It would have been real simple. He could have saved his life and many other people's lives had he just listened and heard what was said to him this morning, but he didn't. Jack Phillips was a young man who was the radio operator on the famed RMS Titanic. The Titanic that sunk in the waters of the Atlantic on April uh, the 14th of 1912. Jack Phillips was the one who was working the radio the night that the Titanic sank. When I say radio, uh, the radio, Brother Hunter, on the Titanic wasn't like you pick it up and, you know, breaker, breaker, one, nine, and you can hear voices coming through. It wasn't that kind of radio. It was very primitive back then. The radio back then was called a Marconi radio. And all it was was basically sending Morse code. You had to listen very intently and send and receive signals and Morse code back and forth to different places. Jack Phillips was on duty that night. And while he was on duty the night that the ship struck the iceberg, he was sending meaningless messages back and forth to a place in Newfoundland where they were passing or close enough to to send messages to, a place called Cape Race, Newfoundland. He was sending messages out by Morse code, and all they were were personal notes and personal dictations from the crew or the passengers uh, to other places so they could get out to their friends. It was just meaningless minutia that he was trying to fulfill their whims and fulfill their desires. And he was sending these messages out to this radio station in Newfoundland. And at about 11 o'clock, about 11 p.m., uh, through the radio chatter, these, these, these uh, radio channels that they had were open. Anybody could hear it. Anybody could tap into it. And about 11 o'clock, there was a ship that was several hours ahead of the Titanic bursted through loud and clear through the radio chatter and started sending this Morse code that ice was in the water and it could be very, very dangerous to the Titanic and all the passengers on board because they could hit an iceberg and sink, which they eventually did. Jack Phillips heard the warning. Jack Phillips heard the warning with his own ears as it came through. This was Jack Phillips' very words that he sent back to the California, the ship ahead of him, Instead of saying, thank you, we'll slow down, we'll listen, we appreciate that. Instead of that, this was his very words back to the California. Shut up, I am busy. That was at 11 o'clock. At about 11.30, 11.40 p.m., 30 or 40 minutes later, the Titanic struck an iceberg that would eventually sink her down to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. There was a warning. There was a clear blast and a clear sound but instead of heeding the warning and listening and hearing what was said jack phillips said i would rather continue doing my meaningless telegraphing i would rather continue doing my minutia instead of listening to something that will not only save me but save 1500 people that ended up dying in the tragic sinking of the Titanic this morning. And I can't help but think to myself and wonder how many people sit amongst us, how many people sit in our pews this morning that I've preached to you time after time after time. I've preached to you about getting saved. I've preached to you about the consequences of your sin. I've preached to you about being faithful. I've preached to you about the things of the Word of God. But instead of listening, I mean, brother, it's been a loud, clear blast from the Holy Ghost. I mean, brother, it's been a loud, clear signal but instead of saying, you know what, preacher, you're right. I'm going to hell without God. I need Jesus Christ. I'm tired of walking my own way and living my own life. Preacher.
preacher, you're right. There's dangers coming. If I keep walking along this way, some of you young people, I've been preaching to you about the dangers of sin and the danger of you just flirting around with Jesus instead of just getting all the way in. Uh, some of you mamas and daddies preach to you about being faithful and being committed and being all the way in because it's not just you. You got children following too. But instead of hitting an altar and saying, that's right, Lord, I'm hearing. Uh, Lord, I'm responding. Uh, Lord, I want you to speak to me. I'm not just going to send it down the road. Instead, you said, shut up. I'm busy. Shut up. I'm doing my own thing. I don't want to hear what you've got to say. I'm not going that direction. I'm going to keep full steam ahead on my own path. Well, brother, there's danger up ahead. Slow down. Stop. Don't go that way. The bridge is out. There's ice in the water. This morning there are benefits of hearing. But, brother, it does you no good if you just brush it off and say, I'm busy. Leave me alone this morning. Some of you, some of you, if you'd listen, like Samuel listened, you know what you'd hear? You know what you'd hear if you'd really listen this morning? You'd hear the Spirit of God speaking to your heart saying, You're lost. You're lost. You don't have any earmarks of being a Christian. You don't have any fruit of being a Christian. You don't have a place or a time where life changed from death to life. You don't have anything in your life that would identify you as a Christian. You are Lost this morning. You know why people don't don't want to. You know why people many times won't get saved because they don't want to admit they lost. You realize that's damaging to the ego to get to a place where you have to say, "Man, you know what? I'm in the wrong place. Man, my life has got me up the creek without a paddle. I'm in the wrong spot this morning. Thursday, third, no, Wednesday, Wednesday. One of our activities." Uh, at our camp, we had to forego doing an activity at a theme park on Wednesday during the day. So our activity for Wednesday was uh, we rented a pontoon boat and two ski boats and, uh, and pulled them kids all around the lake out there and, uh, and had a big time with them. And I was one of the drivers on one of them ski boats pulling them kids. And next Sunday night, we'll show you videos of all that and everything and the Sunday night service. And Brother Kent was the other driver on the other boat. God help her heart. Praise God. And, uh, and we'd pull them kids all over that lake and everything. We was up in this little cove. We'd pull up in there, dump kids out, pick more kids up and go out in the big part of the lake. And, and go, you know, pull them around, let them have a big time. And uh, we, we finally got to the time where it was time that we, it was time to go back to the house. It was time to finish this thing up. And where we had rented the boats from, Brother John, is about eight miles down the lake. And if you made a wrong turn or didn't go just the right way to the channels, you'd get lost. <laughs> you'd get bad lost. And so I, I, we took off up the lake. Brother Keith was in the boat with me. And we took off and come out of there and navigated our way eight miles up the lake about 30 minutes worth we finally come into the dock and the port and Nathan was already there putting the pontoon up and signing everything in and whatever and we pulled up there brother Mike and we started looking at brother Kent we said where's he at he should have been right behind us where where brother Kent go and about that time we got a phone call and he said on the other end he said I don't know where I'm at I said, man, I'm lost. I ain't got a clue where I'm at. And we started talking to him, and the people at the marina started talking to him and said, well, what are you seeing? Where are you? And we couldn't make heads or tails out of where he was. But, brother, the more he got to talking, he finally just said, y'all, I don't know where I'm at. I'm just lost this morning. So you know what we done? Instead of just trying to keep guiding him and directing him, because we didn't know where he was either, we got in the boat and drove 30 minutes back down the lake and started looking for him. And after we drove around a while and drove around a while, finally there he was, sitting over yonder coming at us with, thank God, we finally found him. But the truth is, had we not went looking for Brother Ken, he'd probably still be up yonder at that lake, wandering around, lost out there somewhere. He'd still be up yonder somewhere. You know, I thought about that thing, and I told them afterwards, I said, that's coming to a message near you. Praise God. <laughs> Y'all know something? I remember when I found out I was lost. I, I remember when it come to me one day that I made some wrong turns. And I was lost without God. And I was going to hell without Jesus. But brother, instead of just saying, well, I'm going to do it my way. And I don't care what nobody thinks. Thank God the Holy Ghost of God through sermon and through scripture and through song and through people supplicating for me. I heard the word that said you're lost. But thank God it didn't stop there, Brother Joe. He said, 
I'll come find you. I'll come to where you are. You can't get to where I'm at, so I'll get to where you are. The best day of my life was when I heard that sweet voice that let me know where I was. But he came and he got me this morning. Benefits of hearing. Here we find this one man, Jack Phillips. He didn't hear. He didn't listen. And he ended up killing 1,500 people, including himself. The last thing they saw of Jack Phillips, he was trying to get on an inflatable life raft, and his body ended up sinking below the waters of the Atlantic, never to be heard from again because of that statement, shut up, I'm busy. 1,500 people died, including himself. There was another radio operator. Here's the second man. I'm done. There was another radio operator that same night on a different ship. His story, Brother Cliff, is much different. His name was Harold Cottom. Harold Cottom was a 21-year-old radio operator on the ship known as the Carpathia. The Carpathia was the ship that ended up picking up 700 survivors that were in lifeboats and in the water and rescued them from this awful tragedy. Harold Cottom was sitting at the radio desk, and he had already been there for six to eight hours. He had been doing his job faithfully for six to eight hours. He was about to get off his shift. As a matter of fact, he had got off his shift, walked up on top of the deck, walked around, got some fresh air, and back in these days, they shut the radio off at a certain time. You couldn't radio anymore after a certain time. They'd shut them off and go to bed. And he had walked around, got some fresh air. He was on his way back down below to go to bed. And this is what Harold Cottom said. He said, I thought I'd check the radio one more time. He said, I don't even know why. I just thought I'd check the radio one more time. And when he put those things up to his ears, he began to hear loud and clear the SOS distress signal from the Titanic telling them they had struck ice and they were going down. He began to send messages back and say, surely this is a joke. Surely you can't be serious. They said, we are serious. We're going down. The Carpathia was four hours away. Could not get to them before it sunk. Four hours away, immediately they adjusted their course and started on their way. They said the Carpathia shouldn't have been able to move but 14 knots total speed, high speed. For some reason, they said, those men shoveled so much coal that they steadied a course of 17 knots consistently the entire way, which knocked a bunch of time off the trip to get them there sooner. They said had the Carpathia got there just a couple of hours later, even the people in the lifeboats would have died from wind chill factors out on those icy seas but because of one man who heard because of one man who said I think I'll listen one more time I think I'll just tune in one more time and see what's going on because one man tuned back in he heard the voice he heard somebody that needed help you know what they said about old Harold Cottom they said that Harold Cottom ended up working for five straight days non-stop he worked for five straight days with only ten hours of sleep tirelessly working at his station doing his radio work sending messages out telling people who survived and who had died for five straight days he would not be pulled away from his task you know what he was doing whereas that fella on the uh, Titanic he was just working at things that was meaningless he was working at things that didn't matter this old boy over here he said I'm going to work at something that matters in life I'm going to give my life for something that matters some of you Christians in here y'all keep working on things that don't matter Keep giving your life to things that don't matter this morning. Won't you invest in some eternal things? If you tap in and listen this morning, you'd find out there's sinners dying and going to hell without Jesus Christ all around us. Brother, we're not on a joy cruise. We're on the rescue vessel of the old ship of Zion. And it's our job to toss the lifeline out and tell sinners about Jesus and see sinners saved by the grace of God. But we can't do it if we ain't hearing this morning. It's easy to get to the place where all of the voices of this world distract us from hearing what's important. How many times, how many times have we tuned in and heard things that really just don't matter? I'll be honest with you. Help me over here, Esther, if you would. I, I walked in this morning. And I started talking to some men in the church. And they was telling me, did you see what happened here? Did you hear what happened there? Do you know what happened here? I said, I, no, I missed all of it. Normally, I'm up to date on the latest news and all that. Nick gets my blood pressure up and I get fighting mad. I didn't hear none of it. Say, why? I was in a place where I couldn't hear none of that. 
Wasn't TV one up yonder. I was tuned in to another voice. And I'll be honest with you, brother. It convicted me when I got home to stay tuned out of that world. It made my life a whole lot sweeter. And tune in to the thing that really matters this morning. You know what I found out? If I'll, if I'll tune out of social media and I'll tune out of the opinions of others and just tune in to the opinion of God. Boy, I'm going to tell you what. Hearing His voice helps my heart a whole lot more than hearing anybody else's voice. Some of y'all, it's been a long time since you've heard the voice of God. Oh, you could tell me the latest whatever that's going on in the news or on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. I wonder could you tell me the latest news that God has spoke to your heart. I wonder this morning if you wouldn't do what Samuel did. Come around an altar and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant here. I wonder how many Jack Phillips we have in the auditorium this morning that I preached and all you've said in your heart is, shut up, I'm busy. Shut up, I'm busy, preacher. I got stuff going on. Then I wonder how many Harold Cottoms would there be that would say, I'm going to listen one more time. I'm going to go to that altar and I'm going to ask him to speak one more time. And I'm going to tune in real, real good and have an ear to hear what the Spirit says. So how does God speak? He speaks through just what I've done this morning. Preaching, teaching. That's how He speaks. It's not hard to figure out. I think we make it more complicated than it has to be. And I think many times we're just not interested in what God's got to say. God speak to our hearts. Let's all stand this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, I pray this morning that you would speak. We're listening. Help us to hear. Give us ears to hear. Unplug our ears. Unclog our ears. The spiritual wax has built up for far too long in many of our ears. We have ceased to hear what you would say. Oh God, this morning, help us to tune in. Unplug from this world. Plug into that world. Stop listening to the voices that would condone our sin and make us feel good in our sin and make us think it's okay to live like we're living. Tune into the voice of God that would tell us the truth about what's going on, where we're at. God, give us that which we stand in need of. In Jesus' name. If you need to come, you come. Sing something, Mr. Oh, boy. 
Thank God for his word. You know what it said about Samuel? I didn't have time to deal with Samuel much this morning. You know what it said about Samuel? After the Lord spoke to him, it said this later in that chapter. It said he did let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, he was always listening for the Lord to speak. And anything God said, Samuel said, I'll do it. He didn't, it, it, literally, he's talking about, he, he didn't let any of his word. He just chucked it on the ground and said, oh, I don't, I don't need that. Okay. Tell me something else. You know what I found out? God will never give you more light until you respond to the light he's already given you. That's right. If you have clear scripture on something in your life and you do not deal with the clear scripture God's already given you, God won't give you any more. He'll cut it off. Say, I'm not telling you anything else till you deal with that. You know why some Christians are constantly miserable in their Christian life? Because they got something they know either God doesn't approve of or God's already real clear scripture on and they won't get right over it. They just happy staying right where they are and they never going to advance any farther forward until they go back and deal with that. Oh, they've heard it, but they said, I don't want to hear that. Tell me something else. And God said, no, I ain't telling you nothing else. Not until you deal with that. You deal with that, I'll tell you something else. That's the way God works. I'm so glad that we can hear his voice even in 2020. A lot of distractions try and tune it out. But I'm glad we can still hear his voice. I appreciate a church that likes to hear the truth. A lot of churches don't want to hear the truth. I've preached in them. I preached in them. I thank God for the church that wants the truth. Amen. I had somebody tell me a while back, they said, y'all do too much singing down there at that church. Y'all do too much singing, not enough preaching. I said, uh, you don't come to Sunday school, do you? You don't come to Thursday night either, do you? I mean, I do 45 minutes worth of Bible in Sunday school, 45 minutes generally worth of preaching Sunday morning. 45 minutes worth of preaching Sunday night. 45 minutes worth of preaching Thursday night. What more do you want? It's not a problem that it ain't coming out. It's a problem that people ain't listening. It ain't that it ain't coming out. People just, that ain't what they want to hear. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. Thank God for hearing. Having ears to hear. Say, where are these ears at that you're preaching at this morning? They're not here. They're here. Ears of the heart. Ears of the heart. All right, let's close in a word of prayer this morning. Yes, sir. I thank our church. Not to put it on my heart. Our church needs to pray for our nation. Our nation is at a turning point. Evil is running fast in our nation. We are in a battle. Not by another invasion by another country. It's within. The forces are evil to want to destroy this country. To take it over and build it into their way. And we're in a crossroads with them. And I know there's people that's been praying for this nation, praying for our president. But God said, if we can raise up our voice. <laughs> Amen, Brother Tim. Amen. Amen, Brother Tim. Now let me say something on the back of what Brother Tim said. The nation will never rise any higher than the churches in the nation. 
And the church will never rise any higher than the homes in the church. If the home's out of order, the church will be out of order, and then the nation's out of order. You know why we're seeing the anarchy in our society today? Because there's been no Bible preaching in our churches for a long time. And there's been no truth in our homes for a long time. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing in our nation. You want to know why we're seeing so much disunity in our nation? Because there's been so much discord in the church. And you can't sow seeds of discord and shoot and run and put your stuff here, there, and yonder and then act like, oh, the church is going to be all right. It don't work that way. And if we want to get the nation healthy, we better get this healthy. Amen. Say, pray for the president. I'm all about praying for the president. We're going to do it right now. But let me say this. If you pray for the president more than you pray, pray for your pastor, you ain't right with God. Amen. Somebody help me right there. Anybody, is Donald Trump ever visiting y'all in the hospital? I don't think so. Donald Trump ever preached to y'all? I think sometimes we give far greater benefit of the doubt to political figures than we do folks that's even right here that help us every week. Amen. Amen. Somebody say something bad about Donald Trump, son, I promise you, you'd be on Facebook, my God, you a liberal and I ain't standing for it. Somebody go opposite and say something about somebody in the church and it's like, well, maybe you got a point. Maybe I don't know. You know, it's, it's all right. It's, it's okay. I do pray for my president. I do too. Because he is commander in chief. I do too. Amen. Amen, Brother Tim. We're going to pray for him. We need to pray for him simply because he's in a battle of his sake for this nation. Yes, sir. And I pray for you also every night. I thank God for it, Brother Tim. Yes, sir. Because right now I still have the freedom to do that. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to. God help us if if the forces of the left get in power, what we're doing here, we won't be able to do no more. Amen. Amen. Promise you that. That last election was a big election. This one coming is a huge election. That's right. And you got no reason to complain if you don't get out and vote. So if you ain't registered, go register. And God help you. Don't vote for somebody that's going to kill babies and promote sodomy and Amen. give in to the forces of evil that we see today. Amen. If there's anybody that ought to stand up and make their voices heard, it's the church of the living God. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for what you've given us. God, I want to say I appreciate the freedoms and the liberties that I have as a Christian. And Lord, the truth is, if, if, if this whole thing turns south, and, and God, I've read prophecy, I don't find America anywhere in it. I know eventually she's going to go like the rest of the nations. God, I'm glad that even if everything goes south in the red, white, and blue, I have freedom in Christ. That's something that nobody could ever take from me. What a blessing it is to be a child of the living God. Now God, I pray this morning that you would defend our country from those that would try and harm it and hinder it and do it in. Defend our president, Lord, from the attacks of the devil. Give him people around him that would help him and pray for him and hold him up. God, I pray this morning that you would give us ears to hear. God, I pray this morning you'd give us spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit has said unto the church this morning. And we'll thank you for it and give you the glory for it. Bring us back tonight at 6 o'clock. God, I pray this evening that you'd give us that which we stand in need of to hear once again. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. See you tonight at 6 o'clock.